Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to the British Library this afternoon. And greetings to everybody who's watching online in libraries in, around the country and around the world. We've got many of you here today, so thank you so much all for being here for today's event, celebrating the publication of Tiffany Aching's Guide to Being a Witch. So obviously you've just seen our lovely trailer for our fantasy exhibition, which has just opened over in the main building, and I do hope you'll get a chance to see it sometime over the next five or so months. It's on to the end of February, and we're really proud of it. It's rare manuscripts, first edition, maps, costumes, video games, all kinds of things, to all building up to really diverse and old and new version of what we all know as fantasy fiction and fantasy literature. So uh, do get a chance to see it. Today is a day of firsts. It's the first day of the exhibition, uh, the first event accompanying the exhibition, and the first day you'll ever get a chance to buy a copy of the book, which uh, Gabrielle uh, can, and Rihanna Pratchett have put together in, uh, as a continuation, legacy, homage, whatever you want to discover today to the great works of Terry Pratchett, who we'll be celebrating. But it's not the first Pratchett event, it's the second. We celebrated last uh, month, or earlier this month, the publication of the new rediscovered stories uh, under the title of the Stroke of a Pen. And then in a couple of weeks' time, on this very stage, we'll have uh, Rob Wilkins and Neil Gaiman also celebrating Terry's life and works on the 40th anniversary of The Colour of Magic. So brief a couple of points of housekeeping. Those of you who are in the audience here will be able to ask a question later on. Those of you who are online will also be able to ask questions. There's a little form below the video window. You can put a question in that and it will be relayed through to us and we will be able to put one or two of those to the panel later on. Uh, if you want to buy a book, uh, first chance today, obviously. Um, you could get one outside afterwards, or if you're online, you can go to the books tab at the top of the page, and that will take you to a link, the British Library Bookshop, and you'll be able to order a copy there. So that's all I really need to say, other than to say that our host for today is the fantastic uh, journalist, columnist, Pratchett fan, obviously, uh, Kat Brown. She's uh, also a writer with two books coming out like, next year, uh, which are called uh, I knew I was going to forget this. No one talks about this stuff. Yeah, that's my end. Oh my god! It's really good. It's really, it's really good. And it's not a trend. It's not just a trend. It's not a bloody trend. Not a bloody trend. Bloody yeah. Right. Okay. That's it. So, Kat, Rihanna, and Gabrielle, please enjoy the event. Friday afternoon. Welcome families, freelancers, people just banking off work. It's great <laughs> to have you here. Um, I took, uh, I got this courier to my house this morning and subsequently decided to drastically up the quality of my wardrobe because this is a really, really gorgeous edition. Um, Rob Wilkins was in the green room and he just took it and went, Apparently, this is the sort of thing that we care about with hardbacks now, and uh, I will have to start doing this more. We are here to celebrate, well, actually, the pre-launch, really, of Tiffany Aking's Guide to Being a Witch, which is out on November the 9th from Penguin. But obviously, I think some of you may have already bought your copies from out there, which is wonderful. But also, crucially, we're here to talk to the co-authors, uh, Rihanna Pratchett and Gabrielle Kent, which is just wildly exciting. Um, Rihanna, you have recently stepped into the world of voiceovers for these and I was just wondering <laughs> if you might like to uh, do us the honour of reading Tiffany's introduction to the book to okay. get us off. Would you like some water? Oh I, I do think I, sorry I didn't expect it so fast I haven't, I haven't prepared for it. I do think I need a bit of water. Let me just find it okay. Show of hands who has actually bought the book already? I mean phenomenal work well done. <laughs> I was like, maybe afterwards, but no. Um, there is a suite of signing pens uh, that these ladies have got, so it'll be fab. Um, we're also, just in the background, going to have a really lovely slideshow of some of Paul Kidby's illustrations to the book, which is stunning. Um, but yeah, let's kick off with <coughs> his introduction, which I've just totally put her on the spot for, but that's fine. <laughs> She's a pro. So here you are holding my book. Perhaps you're already an apprentice witch, looking for extra guidance on the future. Maybe you've been earmarked by a witch finder as someone with potential, and you're wondering just what that might mean. 
or possibly you're simply curious about what might be in these pages and are looking forward to correcting me, pretending you haven't read it, or treating me with a lethal amount of politeness next time our paths cross. Whether you've bought, begged, borrowed or stolen this book, you are welcome here. This book was written over a number of years. I've lost some dear friends along the way. Their teachings live on in these pages, as do their notes, which I've retained for posterity. They live on in me, and now I hope they will live on in you too. For me, finding my personal past to witchhood was hazy at best, but it also involved a book, the goody childies book of fairy tales. Not exactly a guide to being a witch, so much as a guide to not being one. The teller of these tales clearly imagined the goody childy would, uh, would empathise with the noble princes, beautiful princesses, brave woodcutters and those who abuse the letter E. Not me. <laughs> princes were dull and mostly made of chin. And besides, they, may, they mainly seem to do daft things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I moved, jumped ahead there. I didn't have the poise, breeding, or the good hair to be a princess. Besides, they, they mainly seem to do daft things with spindles or apples or sat around waiting to be rescued. Their lives were both dangerous and boring. Woodcutters appeared a little more competent, but aside from occasion, an, an occasional break to, ki to kill a talking wolf, I wasn't sure I wanted to chop wood all day. And since I've never been good with an axe, we were approaching dangerous and boring territory again. Witches now, they seemed much more fun. OK, there was a certain amount of being shoved in ovens by greedy children or talking to mirrors, so danger was a given. But witches were dangerous and exciting. They got broomsticks, wands and magic spells. And, as I imagined back then, they, want, well, they went to learn witchcraft at a special school, probably taken there on the back of a unicorn or something equally magic like that. But witchcraft isn't about magic or showy spells at least not most of the time, it's largely about hard work and realising that true magic, true power, is not about understanding spells, but understanding people. Hearing their spill words, the things they almost say but don't or can't. Being a witch is about facing your fears and understanding that even if something isn't your fault, it's your responsibility. It's about being a voice for the voiceless and standing between the light and the darkness, and more often, uh, often than not, it's about having a piece of string on you. <laughs> if you're still with me, then maybe this is the life for you. And I'm glad, because the world needs witches and witchcraft, in whatever form they take. As you tread the path you've chosen, you will learn the lessons of those who gift you with their wisdom and knowledge. They will become part of you, because you are not just a witch. You are all witches that have come before you and will come after you. This, really, this isn't really my book. It's our book. As for the school, it's not a place. It's all places. Just look around you. You're already there. Oh, lovely. Oh, it's all a bit teary. <laughs> Looking at this absolutely gorgeous silhouette on the cover, there's also a lovely line on the back of the book, which is from Tiffany saying, they say you don't find witchcraft, it finds you. And before we actually talk about the meat of the book itself, I was wondering if you could just tell me a little bit about your experiences or thoughts around magic and witchcraft sort of growing up and how that's been in your lives. You talk for a bit. <laughs> More water, Rihanna. Um, so my, my mother's Irish and her, she grew up on a farm in Galway and um, it just feels like there's always been magic in my life with my, my grandmother's stories of, um, she used to talk about, a lot about the little people actually. She used to save every kiss I gave her, she saved in a tin on the dresser and she said it was to trade with the little people. And um, I was thinking if she actually meant beagles, then they'd probably be more interested in her putching that she made. <laughs> um, but she had just the most amazing stories. Just magic was an everyday part of, of life with, with my grandma. Every, she just saw magic in, in absolutely everything. Um, and, you know, I've, yeah, I always felt that growing up. And I think your dad actually, you know, would, uh, what did he say to you about sort of magic and... I think it's used to, well, you, you also keep your, keep your mind open to wonder, mm. which I think we, we incorporated a little bit in the book as well. Um, but yeah, grannies, I think, were, were very important to both of us. We realised that we both actually had shepherdess grandmothers. Mm. Um, my my uh, maternal grandmother, who's known as Mum's Mum, had a, a flock of Jacob sheep. 
um, that she, she had for, for wool, and um, my uncle and my grandfather would, would shear them and treat the wool, and then Dad would actually spin the wool, and then my gran would, would knit it into... Uh, the, the jumpers that are mentioned in the book, which are so stiff that they can stand up by themselves, and usually have some kind of barnyard animal knitted into the front of them. Um, but yeah, I, I, the first book that I really registered Dad writing, because I, I kind of, when you're a kid, you don't pay that much attention to what your parents do, it's just what your parents do. Mm. And then he was serialised on Woman's Hour, and I was like, oh my God, Woman's Hour, my mum listened to Woman's Hour, that's not, that was just special, like, oh my God, he's on Woman's Hour, and he must be doing something cool, I think I'll have a listen. And then I like taped it off the radio, and I think I'd heard my dad say that it was... It was certainly, Esk was certainly the, the character that he openly said was based on me. There's a lot of me in all his, his female, uh, his younger female characters. But Esk was the one he said he based on me when I was eight. And I think that intrigued me as well. And I just listened to it over and over again. Um, and the, I think that's one of the reasons why The Witches became my favourite uh, stories um, and strand of Discworld writing. Um, but yeah, I, my, my grandmother was very important to me, my paternal grandmother she was more kind of into Greek myths and legends and she was like very big on storytelling and things like that and something that his dad's granny was as well so yeah witchy grandmothers are definitely big in my family. Yeah. <laughs> well with that in mind even though lots of you well done uh, seem to have bought the book already particularly for our online viewers it's a little bit like sort of talking about air or something so would you be able to just sort of take us through a little bit about what the book is what it's about, how it's sort of laid out, all that sort of thing. It does, I should, I should point out to everybody, have that kind of rich, unctuous writing that <laughs> Nanny Og so appreciated on invitation. Yes. And I've spent most of today just pouring at this book. Actually. The edges, the yeah. edges. Yeah. Yeah. The shiny edges. And the, the shiny edges as well. Just to, yes, fend off people by reflecting this in the mirrors. But yeah, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a bit about yeah. basically, I suppose, what it is before we get into how it's all come together. Yeah, well, you look at it. So yeah, when we, uh, I mean, it, it was decided that there needed to be sort of something like this to celebrate, obviously, the 20th anniversary of the, the Tiffany book. So Rhi and I got our heads together and um, thought, well, what would a witch need to know in the disc world? What are the important lessons to learn? So we made um, a big long list of what we thought were all just the key aspects of, of witchcraft. Um, on the disc, and then we uh, threw that out to each other, um, the list to pick and choose which chapters we wanted to do from that. So I, you know, I thought we might end up arguing a bit over some of these chapters, but weirdly, um, we both got exactly the chapters we wanted. There were no arguments mm. at all. Um, we, yeah, um, we dealt with the areas that we were particularly passionate about in the book. Um, but yeah, it was, it was that kind of drawing up of a list of everything that we thought was key to being a witch. On the Everything a witch should know, but annotated inevitably yeah. with interference oh. from all of the other witches <laughs> as well. Um, where did that sort of idea come from and how did you manage to think about how you wanted to sort of bring all the other witches in? Because obviously in the wider series mm. that can be quite interfering, but here it just sort of <laughs> Work. Well, I mean, the witches are very interfering. Yeah. The witches are interfering. That's all part of being a witch. Um, and we wanted to get the, the older witches' voices in there, and we thought we could have a lot of fun with it. Um, and I think we sort of uh, kind of looked towards... Is it the Jedi Guide? It does a similar oh, thing. yeah, they all have... Uh, like that. And, and we just thought it, it would be fun, good to get jokes in and anecdotes, and, and sort of it really took on a life of its own. So it's the, the predominant witches... That, that comment are a nanny og and granny weatherwax. And we sort of went back and forth thinking, okay, when it, exactly has she written this? So it, the idea was it, she wrote it in bits during her time and then sort of gathered it all together and then published it um, kind of later. So we, we wanted to make sure granny weatherwax was in there um, and Miss Tick, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Le uh, Lettuce Earwig is in there as well. Um, and I think we've got a little bit. We, Rob, anybody is in there? Yeah, There's a little bit, tiny bit of toad. Yeah. Um, S even gets to write a bit. S has written a bit. Well. Jeffrey's written a bit. Um, so yeah, we it, it was just a lot, lot of fun. We wanted to kind of make it like which is pl plural thing rather than just which. Um, yeah, and it was it was a, it was great fun to do. 
whenever there was anything that could be taken a different way, you sort of, yeah, we would comment, oh, there's no way Nanny Og would let that go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a little comment in the margin. <laughs> there is no double entendre left on turn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's scribbled out a little bit. Yeah. Exactly. For the kiddies. And I did actually sort of really take it up to my face to see if I could see through the scribbles, <laughs> oh, yeah. and I can't, sadly. It's very upsetting. <laughs> so... I, this is obviously a brand new book, brand new endeavour for you both, but I understand that you two have known each other for, what, 20 years? Something it's like that? It's about nearly 20 years. year anniversary. It, it is. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that is lovely. So how did, I suppose, how did this writing partnership come about, but also how did you two come across each other in the first place? It was you, know, a, you, you remember it better than I do. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Much better with dates. It was like, so we both worked in video games and um, working in video games, particularly in the, the 90s, um, you just didn't meet any of the women working in games. It was very rare. Um, and then someone organised, a, a man actually organised the very first Women in Games conference in 2004. And we went along and it was suddenly there was a room full of women doing the same jobs as us. And it was just such a breath of fresh air. We could actually talk about stuff. And um, I saw, I, so I saw Re chatting to, I think I interrupted you were talking to someone. I was like, you're Ree Pratchett. And I got that look as though to say, oh, yeah, you're going to mention dad next. And I was like, no, I love the work you've done for PC Zone. And she said, oh, and you look like Evil Willow from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I love Buffy, and who doesn't? So, and then we kind of linked arms and skipped <laughs> up into the sunset. <laughs> Did your parents get to know each other? Was that something that came up or they knew each other somehow did you say oh uh, well um <laughs> yeah <laughs> thinking back to the, the yeah the first time that I met Terry Pratchett uh he did encounter my dad um so Sounds slightly threatening Gabrielle yeah <laughs> <to be honest. laughs> so, interesting story so um I went to the signing of uh Last Continent in the late 90s up in Newcastle um queues right down the street. Uh, Dad had brought a lot of books with him. Uh, <laughs> so we finally got to the, the front of the queue and uh, my dad unloaded his Pratchett collection and Terry sort of, yeah, he, went, he did sign them all for him and then my dad went to pack them all up. And then I got my book signed and uh, Terry was saying, uh, Terry, I, I was a little bit gothy um, at the time, and uh, he was saying, uh, oh, are you a goth? And I said, oh, I, I don't, I mumbled something about not wanting to put labels on my <laughs> <laughs> And he said, oh, no, you don't have enough of the, uh, the panda That's a very eye. goth thing to say. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know. Um, he said, I suppose you've got some, he was about to sign the book, and he said, I suppose you've got some kind of fantastic name, Araminta Diamanda or something. I said, Carol. I was called Carol at the time. <laughs> and he just uh, he just looked at me and said, what wanker called you Carol? <laughs> and I kind of just side-eyed to my dad who was packing up all of his books. <laughs> but um, actually, I was thinking, that was just as I was graduating from university and I had been thinking about changing my name for some time. I mean, that absolutely decided it for me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you, could have, you could have been a Padita. I could have that been a Padita. That yeah. was a suggestion we both made at the same time. And I hadn't actually read Masquerade at that point, so I didn't realise that was a character he'd written. And that made me think, oh, was he, was he commenting on the fact that it was, uh, was it, I was this dressed as Perdita, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dressed as Perdita, but maybe an Agnes Nish, really, inside. I would definitely cast your writing partnership <laughs> into a different light. Which yes. one's Agnes and which one's Perdita? Um, so when did you decide to actually write it together and and sort of why was it just that there was the sheer amount of almost an in, writing an encyclopedia to do and wanting to actually split it up um I think part of it you know I, I'd been friends with Gary for so long she was um doing some work with me um as a writer's assistant and doing bits and pieces for Narrativia and um I just thought it would be really fun to do, I think. And it, it's, it's always fun when you take your best friend along. Mm. And it felt like narratively we could kind of link arms. And, yeah, and, it, and I knew how much the witches meant to, to Gabrielle. And, um, yeah, they meant the same thing to me, and we talked a lot about them. And it just seemed like, yeah, this is... An, um, Gabrielle's a, a, a brilliant children's writer in her own right, and I'd been reading her books for a while, and it just seemed like this: this is it. This is the this is the one. This is, it, and it was like 
surprisingly easy. It like, was, yeah. She came away saying, oh, you, you're, you're really easy to work with. I said, yeah. <laughs> it was wonderful. It's a, uh, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. I spent 20 years in the games industry having come out as a terrible tortured <laughs> angst. Well, I have a bit, but um, yeah, it was, it was just, it was very smooth and it was about kind of making each other laugh and cry. Yeah. And, mm. and I think that's the secret to all partnerships, especially if there's comedy involved. It's make, you're making each other laugh. Yeah. And how did you work together? Because you said that when it came to topics in the book, which cover everything from spirits to cottages and everything in between, and also all of favourite characters as well. You said it was quite an easy split. So which sort of topics did each of you immediately go for, and how did you go about the process of actually doing the work? I'm going to need to remember what the chapters are. <laughs> I, think I, I tended towards what yeah. I think I saw as more frivolous topics, like, you know, attire and but not companions so. and stuff. And Gabby's felt more serious, but I, I, found the seri I managed to find, like, the serious, uh, serious bits within the, the kind of lighter chapters. And, and Gabrielle found the, uh, the, the lighter bits within the seriousness. Yeah, and sort of, yeah, we... We, yeah, we did have a lot of fun sort of going, you kind of lightened up some of mine and yeah, we kind of brought pathos and bathos. Yeah, so <laughs> each of us sort of was the main writer on one chapter yeah. and then the other would edit and then I think the ending was, was both of our work. Very cool. Um, and yeah, I don't know, it just, it just kind of worked. I think I did one of the earlier chapters which was attire, which was used as a kind of mm -hmm. like proof of concept mm. uh, one as well. Um, I do remember you. So at one point, there's a quite a serious chapter I'd done near the end, and you were looking to sort of add some nanny og comments. Yeah. Oh, I was really worried about her adding a nanny og comment to a quite a serious bit. She said, "Don't worry, I'm not going to bathos your pathos." <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, because we were working together, we could see each other. We were working together on Zoom, so we could see each other on screen all the time as we were working, and we were working in live documents, so we could see each other writing and birthing jokes so we were able to kind of yeah chat and uh watch each other i could i could watch her highlighting every time i used and to start a sentence <laughs> i don't <laughs> realize you're passively watching. aggressively highlighting it so i could see what i'd done i didn't realize you're watching like a naughty at writer. the time <laughs> <laughs> well you talk about like attire being frivolous but Paul Kidby has done these amazing illustrations, again, all, but all through the book. It's just absolutely gorgeous. He obviously took them extremely seriously. Yeah, yeah, there are pages uh, and I mean, pages more dedicated to hats. than, say, like, you know, life and death of yeah. gods and monsters. But it, it is, uh, it, they were really fun to do because they're so, they're so linked heavily to the witches and who, who the witches are. Um, and, yeah, Paul's illustrations were, were just so utterly <coughs> marvellous. And I... I we ended up writing extra bits into the book because Paul wanted to draw them. So he wanted to do some of the um, creatures from Fairyland. So you'll see the, the, the drone coming up behind us and the, the grim hounds as well. So we sort of worked them in. So Paul got a chance to, um, to draw them. And I think, as, as is often the way with Paul, Rob had to basically chisel the pen out of his hands <laughs> to get him to stop drawing things if we have to publish the book. But yeah, it was, it was wonderful to see it come to life like that. And we've been illustrated by Paul. Did you see the author's photos? The author's <laughs> photos are Paul Kidby illustrations. We've been illustrated yeah, by Paul Kidby, Paul Kidby yeah. which was very, uh, was very, very Absolutely stunning by illustrations that. of Terry, Rihanna and Gabrielle. And then Paul has drawn himself essentially as a potato. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose think, if you've done all the work, why bother on yourself? I think so. Rob anybody drew that for him, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, um, there are some lovely interactions in the comments and the margins between Rob and Paul, yeah. especially as regards to um, Paul drawing the Nat McFeagles a little too accurately and worries that the, the guards are going to come and find them. So find them. <laughs> well, um, we've, just, we've just actually seen uh, Mrs Arwige slash Earwig go past, so... I, I know that you've sort of taken turns in, in writing from the perspective of a lot of the characters, but Rihanna, I know you've got a particular <laughs> penchant slash passion for ghastly Mrs Earwig, and uh, I wondered if you might read... read you have to find thing. it. So, um, uh, Mrs Lettuce Earwig, or Weech, uh was written by Gabby, but I actually voiced her for the audible version of it. <laughs> so, can you give me a live version of Mrs, <laughs> Mrs Earwig? Dear Mr Goatburger, 
is the author of many best-selling books on witchcraft, such as First Flights in Witchcraft, The Haya Magic, My Fairy Friends, and To Ride a Golden Boomstick, Imagine My Surprise When I Was Not Consulted on Your Most Recent Acquisition, Guide to Being a Witch by Young Tiffany Ecking. I have managed to avail myself of a number of pages from this guide and soon discovered an army of omissions and inaccuracies. Please find enclosed my, uh, my corrections for inclusion. It also includes my card, should you wish to further avail yourself of my extensive knowledge of magic, witchcraft, and wizardry. Regards, Mrs. Lettuce Awaj. <laughs> I'm just forever impressed that you can make such a ghastly character a hundred <laughs> times more ghastly. <laughs> so good. Um, uh, Paul, when you say that Paul has illustrated like pretty much everybody, there is a particularly gorgeous picture of Anoya, the goddess of, of well, not draws, but basically everything that's sort of been lost, <laughs> but depicted as Botticelli's Venus, surrounded by floating forks, which just feels like... He went off on one, and then we lost him for a couple of weeks. And did that. Do you have any favourite illustrations in the book? I know there's tons. Oh, we really... Um, yeah, there's a lot of ones that we, we um, really love. There's a, there's a really great coven picture. Oh, oh this is a really good one of, of um, Rob with the, the dragons coming out of the page. That is one. I mean, they're all so good. There's a really wonderful esque oh, picture S with the dungeon dimension um, creatures behind, or it's just yeah. Uh, that that's really great. I mean, so the the coven I'd say is one of my favourite because of the like the personalities of the witches really come out in in each individual um, image within it. But yeah, that's it's just like. It's like, oh, that's lovely. Oh, that's amazing. And then, like, every page is, is just gorgeous. Yeah. We've got a little explanation as well for why... Um, oh, my goodness, I've forgotten her name. It begins with an A. Which, Anagramma. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen. She who shall not be named. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yes. Why yes. she's not in the Why coven she's picture. not in the coven yeah. picture. And it was none of the other witches. They all said they'd let her know, but none of them let her know about the... Uh, <laughs> about the yeah, that actually got, yeah, that got you to comment. <laughs> but, yeah. Thinking about names, though, when I was reading it, there were some names where I was like, is my memory just going even more, or have I not heard this before? But no, you said that there were a couple that you, that you were able to sort of name yourselves mm. in that. Yeah. Who were they? Who were they? So um, Miss, Miss Level was never given a first name, so she's Constance Level now. Um, and uh, the, the Kelder, the, uh, the first, the first Kelder, Kelder yeah. from uh, We Free Man is called Maeve. Uh, those are the ones that we, we named. I don't know if that, we didn't name anything else. It feels like those are the, the only two. I don't think we, we had to run it. We ran them by Rob just in case. Yeah. <laughs> There's some. I feel like Constance Level didn't get the laugh that it actually deserved. <laughs> <laughs> um, where, did, where did Maeve come from, or was that just like. Just really good reasons. Scottish names, because a few had been taken up with, um, with previous Kelders. Mm. So, yeah, it, was just, it just seemed a kind of nice one. It does fit very nice. But Constance Level does, it, like, she looks, she's the one that looks a bit like Joan Hickson. You come up, yes. and it just it, like, work, really works with her image. Yeah, it's lovely sort of seeing the illustrations matching almost what you've got in your head, yeah. even though you didn't know and everybody else. And um, you also mentioned that there is a one Easter egg for everybody to look out for that you were particularly proud of. The, yeah, there's a Hitchhiker's Guide uh, joke in there, which is, is my, my most favourite pun I've ever made in the world ever. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, like, so excited. I was like, Gabby, you guys, like, like spot, the pun, spot the pun, spot the pun, spot the pun. See if you can spot it. And you, and did, you did that. Spot no, it. I didn't spot it. I wrote about Hitchhikers, and, and it was only when Rihanna went, it's that. I was like, oh, that is good. So I really hope that you'll all be more observant than I actually am. Um, this is a guide to being a witch, but one of the reasons that I think so many of us have just absolutely adored the Tiffany Aching books in particular is that really peculiar thing that young adults and children's fiction has is of being able to talk about life, how to be a person, and how to deal with really difficult things in sort of the purest way possible. Um, I've basically got an enormous list here of just things that I really enjoyed in terms of like life advice and everything. But I was just wondering if there were any moments that you had both sort of really enjoyed bringing into it, or even I suppose bringing out of the books themselves to bring in here. Oh, I mean, yeah, there was a lot. I mean, we just love 
the way the witches think and just their practical approach to everything and the, the fact that, you know, magic is, you know, it's almost looked down upon actual magic. Um, it's just the practicality and the strength behind those um, characters was just, yeah, wonderful to work. It was interesting to think about, I mean, the way the witch's attitude towards death as well. Um, so we've kind of talked about, um, talked about that and... Um, yeah, headology. I mean, we can all live a better life, I think, through headology. So we were yeah, quite keen to um, to talk about that. Any that you particularly? The augishness. The augishness, mm. yes. <laughs> augishness and and the power of listening and, and mm. Nanny Og's like, power of listening and, and how kind of augishness encircles you like a serpent. And by the time you can smell the tobacco, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, that was a lot. I think... Yeah, we found stuff in, in, in the middle of it, really. Um, and we were, particularly the ending, um, which we both wrote, and we were like, we would, would read the chapters uh, out to each other. Um, and like, we, this was the end one we read, and we were basically on Zoom sobbing and drinking whiskey. <laughs> yeah, like, you have to drink, we, I drink whiskey for hard, for hard chapters and hard scenes and things like that. So, yeah, whiskey and tears. <laughs> uh, over the ending and um, yeah there was a lot of like the, the kind of dedication as well to our dad um, yeah we just there was so much there was so much fun and and um, you know laughter and philosophy and wisdom um, and I think we were we were we're now like full uh, wit Discworld witch experts, I think. Oh, yeah. We thought we were <laughs> fairly good when we went in, but yeah, we, we were just constantly back and forth. We had all the text and we were like word search, you know, checking word searches constantly. And uh, you found that which uh, something doesn't count herdology as a word or something, which like. Oh, yeah, we, uh, that wasn't a searchable oh, yeah, we word. Se yeah, herdology wasn't a searchable word in one of the books. Like, we, it, like weird little stuff like that. And. and putting things together that weren't necessarily linked in the books they, as well. Yeah. So you, you want to talk about you? Yeah. The you. cat you, not you. The cat you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to talk about me now. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we just pieced something together as we were writing. That It's never explicitly stated in the, the books, but you, the cat that, um, uh, that Tiffany gives to Granny Aching. Um, Granny Weatherwax. Granny Weatherwax, <laughs> sorry. Uh, that she gives to Granny Weatherwax. Um, yeah, it's never explicitly stated where you comes from, but we realised in another book, which is a pure white cat, it's referred to that um, Tiffany had gone to the house. So it was the Widow Cable. Widow, ca Widow, Widow Cable. cable yeah. uh, she'd passed away and a litter of cats had been born on her bed, pure white kittens, um, and had, you know, prioritised practicality yeah. and actually ate the body. Um, and she said she had to, ter because of the story, she had terrible trouble finding homes for these cats. And then suddenly me and Rihanna were like, wait, wait, is is you one of the Widow Cable's kittens? And we, yeah, we realised that that must be what yeah. was intended, but it's never explicitly stated. And you have to really sort of dig into the books to realise that, that you was one of the cats born on the bed and um, yeah, prioritised survival over sentimentality. Which is a very <laughs> weather wax thing to do, really. Of so course, you know, you yes. see where they bonded. And you just know that you and all of the rest of those cats would turn up their noses at whiskers, Felix. <laughs> oh, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so something that's really stuck with me from just reading through it every now and then like lines jump out and not even the really gorgeous annotations which are so funny particularly nanny og obviously every now and then mm -hmm. tiffany has her little tiny spill thoughts coming out and she's just like would you like to tell me who you're talking about there tiff <laughs> and it's just not but it was in the feagles chapter and it's just reiterating the idea that um it goes to show that what may seem ordinary and unremarkable to you may be heaven to someone else and then the little annotation from Rob going, big jobs don't know how good you've got it and all that sort of thing. But it feels like the witches and one of the reasons why they have been not just popular and successful, but just loved and very deeply loved is because they show that magic at its heart is about hard work and caring and just showing up every day and in turn giving you the inspiration to sort of to actually do that. And that if you don't appreciate whether it's just you know the mundanity of sort of everyday life or having to do that then more for you really and obviously as the world's leading experts in the witches now <laughs> um what sort of lessons have you taken away from 
from this book particularly? Are you looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was there's plenty of hard work actually went into this, and it's sort of yeah. Um, I think yeah, you know, I think we were very kind of well versed in the lessons of the witches. Anyway. Yeah, I and think they're, so. they're very practical, so it was it was sort of c came through my DNA anyway. Like mm. the uh, you know the practice were very practical people. They believed mm. in helping people with skin, so turning up, doing the hard work, yeah. rolling up your sleeves, like whatever the situation, and that was like definitely carried through my family. So it was sort of like what were family lessons were kind of then, what were family lessons to me were then like turned into kind of a narrative. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, for me, it's difficult to know when, you know, just living my life and, and it, it being part of the narrative that there is also intertwined, I think. Mm. One of the, oh, would you like a glass of water? Would you like a glass of water? Is that what she's asking? Okay, perfect. Oh, no, that's lovely. <laughs> Anybody else wants a glass of water? <laughs> yeah. um, I think one of the one of the moments that sort of really stopped me was not not necessarily anything to do with your dad, although obviously all of his work permeates why we're reading this book and here. But it was it was in a piece that I understand that Gabrielle wrote, which is the idea of the call. And when we think of headology and you know that everyday graft of being a witch, this just sort of really not necessarily, it, it just sort of felt like something that sums up without wanting to be a total philosophy about it, but what it means to be a human. Um, and now I've obviously made it far too important and everything, but <laughs> Gabrielle, would you mind? Would you like was, it? Was it was, I think it's, it's quite, quite near the end. It's not oh, it's the end, but it's like pre no. the end. It might be right before our yeah. final outro. Paths have travelled. <laughs> This is really long. Cause I was oh, wondering about holding it up to the camera, and then I was like, "That's just going to be the worst tease in the world." Yeah, you just can't zoom. Oh, yeah. Here, look at these tiny, tiny oh, there we go. things. Cool. There we go. There we go. Right, it's it's a while since I've read this <laughs> actually. So. Yeah, so this is in a the chapter, the, the penultimate ch um, chapter, life and death, which is where we discuss yeah the practicalities and traditions of death. But this piece particularly is on the call. At the end of our days, witches have the honour of being collected by death himself. We're also gifted with the knowledge of when we're going to die, often down to the exact minute. This is referred to as the call. I don't know how it works. None of us do until we receive it. The information usually comes to us a day or two in advance, which gives us time to clean our cottages, put our affairs in order and pick a successor. Some witches even choose to hold a big going away party instead of a funeral as Miss Treason pointed out when she sent me out to arrange party food and deliver invitations to a big send-off before she died, I don't see why I shouldn't have some fun. I won't be sad or afraid when I eventually receive the call and death comes for me. Those feelings are for those left behind. I've seen what lies beyond the dark door, and as with life, it's just another journey. Many people I've known and others I've loved have passed through that door before me, and no matter how long or short a time we have on the disc, the best we can do is leave behind a life well lived, or at least leave the world just a little better than we found it. Mm. I think from there it would probably be a good point to move on to some audience questions. But first of all, I'd just really love to thank Rihanna and Gabrielle, and we can give them what they deserve. <laughs> Beautifully read as well, by the way. I'm sorry for leaping on you and going, oh, no. read, read. <laughs> okay. But I think we all enjoyed that, so that would be brilliant. Has anybody got any questions? And can I also please just do the familiar thing of just maybe saying it is a question and not just a comment? That would be wonderful. <laughs> Gentlemen in the third row. Mics, uh, oh, we've got some mics. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Oh, perfect. If you wouldn't mind passing it down to the third row, just here. Thank you. Okay. Was that Mark up there? Hello. Yes, we'll come to you in a minute. Brilliant. Sorry, darling. I don't know all of you individually by now. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I, I was just wondering, because of your history together, are there any plans for a new Discworld video game, maybe based on Tiffany or the book or exploring? <laughs> um, we, we've just never had a... Uh, even with Downwards Alive, we never had a pitch that was, that was right. But also... You know, I, I, I'm doing a lot of other things as as well as games, like you know, TV work, movie work, that kind of thing. And um, 
So I know I'd have how much time I'd have to devote to a disc golf game. And it's actually finding, yeah, finding the right studio to do it that um, would be able to kind of con convey the humor of it. Um, yeah, we just never had the, the, right, the right pitch. We're kind of open to it, but it's sort of, it's difficult. There's all weird rights issues and not very exciting. But yeah, I, like we're, we're open to it, but um, yeah, just never. Yeah, you know, Dad was always very, as many, many of you know, Dad was very sa savvy about games. He just never, there was never a good pitch that came our way. I think I've only managed to complete about five minutes of any of the Discworld games. Yeah, they are very, like, yeah, they're very tough. Incredibly hard. Hard. Yeah. hard, yeah. Incredibly hard. <laughs> <laughs> the first one famously, if you got the butterfly out of the way, you were never going to get out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Mark. Right. Hello. Uh, can I have two very quick ones? Let's like. see how good your first one is. Okay. <laughs> the first, the, so question, question one was, one of the things I love about the witch books is how much obscure English folklore is buried in them. All the stuff about hares and the, that kind of thing. Uh, and I wondered if that was something that you wanted to carry on and incorporate, if there's any like, new, kind of old, new old folklore in there. Uh, so that was question one. Can I give you question two straight? Let them yeah. answer question one first. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think that, that we, we incorporated folklore to do with horseshoes and uh, into the iron chapter. I remember yeah, adding extra there is... folklore bits. There's also like what I call Pratchett lore as well. So Miss oh, yeah. gives um, uh, well gives advice on on milking goats, and obviously grew grew up with goats and. Um, yeah, we had to, to milk them at least once a day, if not more. And she talks about, um, you know, the, go the goats are always basically trying to, to knock, knock the milk over. And, and uh, one of the things you could do to sort of subdue them a little bit is bite their ear. <laughs> um, like, not hard, but like, a go goats have ears like carpet. So not, but uh, goats, you have to establish a hierarchy with goats. They've got to know that you're the head goat. And within a kind of goat flock, the head goat will, will just nip the other goat's ears. So you have to, when you're milking a goat, and I learned this from my parents, that you, you just like, you can give the, the, goat, the, the ear a gentle bite and it's, it doesn't really hurt the goat, but it, sh it, shake, it sh uh, it's like shocks them a little bit. They go, oh, clearly you're the head goat, I'm not going to mess around with the milk bucket. And so that isn't actually in the books, but that was just a bit of like, Pratchett goat law that I like, kind of rolled in. I also just know that this is going to really help somebody in a really random yeah. situation. Yeah. <laughs> and if it does, please report back to Rihanna. Um, I think biting someone's ear can get you out of quite a lot of situations. <laughs> <laughs> and get you into one. Yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> and something that I'd completely forgotten from the books and which was really beautifully noted here was after um, Granny Aching's passing, um, when the little tuft of wool was put on her for her yeah. to go and, and as if to sort of, I think in the gods chapter, as if to tell the gods that it's not her fault she wasn't in church. She was yeah. on a hill being yeah, a shepherdess. Yeah. And that was really gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mark, what's your second question? Thank you. I'm glad I didn't have to bite anyone's ear to get that. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, the other one is, is there uh, like a minor or background character from the books that you've enjoyed being able to shine a light on with this one? Minor characters, um... I mean, Jeffrey got. I mean, well, yeah, he's not really a minor character, but he only appears in the last book, didn't he? Yeah, got Jeffrey, Jeffrey's got Jeffrey a, a nice chapter on sheds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it was it was good to get Jeffrey in there, um, and to, uh, Esk as well. Um, I, I guess you, again, a sort of starring a, a cameo character in, in the mm -hmm. Tiffany books. Uh, le, le, you know, Lettuce Earwig became a lot of fun like later in the day. Yeah. And it was such a... I'm so glad we were able to, to get it in because all her notes are on, like, as it cards that have been pinned into the book. And that works so nicely as well. Um, I think, yeah, this... I got to play with the witches and the coven a little bit. Uh, yeah. Lucy Tockley and... Oh, sorry, was, oh, I'm getting mixed up. Was it Lucy Warbeck or Lucy Tockley? There's two Lucys. There is, isn't yeah. there? I'm going back to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which was the one in this coven? Oh, and, uh, uh, it's uh, Lucy Warbeck. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, and Patchouli Lucy Tockley well. was Diamanda Tockley, wasn't she? And she was chasing Dem out. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, we're just having a chat. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is what writing the book was like. <laughs> <laughs> was it that one? But there were also some mentions of, of witches that, to be honest, I just hadn't read the books that they were in for oh, so um, long. Uh, um, 
Mother Gogol. Hilter. Oh, Hilter and... Goat Hilter. Yeah, oh, there, there was a there was gorgeous really, illustration yeah, of Hilter that's edition. been going around. Oh, and this is Goody Wemper, who, I don't know, does Goody ever actually... Yeah, maybe, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, um, so there's a gorgeous picture of uh, Goody Wemper, and you get sort of, uh, some of her advice coming through. She was a research witch, wasn't she? So we, there's a chapter on the types, different types yeah. of witches, enterprising witches, uh, such as Hilter and Mrs. Proust, and uh, research witches, yeah, that's, such that's as Mrs. Level, yes. Miss Level and uh, fun. Yeah, Goody. And the other witch who was also a wizard. Yes. Where is she? Yeah. I literally only got this book this morning, so I'm afraid my flicking through is not yet familiar enough to be able to go, it's here, flickwise. <laughs> it's yeah. towards the end. Yeah, oh, well, so that's, that's yeah, the less travelled. One of the uh, corrections, isn't it? Marchessa. Yeah, Marchessa. Yes, yeah. there we go. Oh, that's a great picture. We had to really it's dig. I think that's that. on the, 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 the latest Discworld calendar, Marchessa. Yeah, yeah that's she gorgeous. Features, is it Colour of Magic she's in or Light Fantastic? Like fantastic, thank you. <laughs> and you, the big experts in the audience. <laughs> yeah, who needs Wikipedia when we've got yeah. that? Sort of, it's wonderful. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Oh, Catherine, yes, you're going to... Oh, we're going live to the libraries. Fantastic. And we actually have a question online. Oh, um, This is a, a bit of a technical witch skills-based question. Oh. Um, when Tiffany pulls the pain out of Roland's father, where did she get that skill from? Do oh. other witches do it? Yes, there's a whole section on this balance and transference section um, where we talk about that. So uh, Tiffany actually learns that skill from Granny Weatherwax, who uh, does it to, to show off a bit at one point, to show off when she hears that Mrs. R. Winch has a new book out. She's like, well, can she do this? And she pulls the heat from a cup of tea, doesn't she, and puts it into Tiff's arms. So Tiff yeah. feels the warmth and it turns the tea to ice. And then she teaches Tiffany that skill. And then Tiffany uses that to, um, yeah, to ease the pain of the Baron when he's uh, suffering and puts that pain then into... Uh, there's a, we go into this in some detail in the book, so you'll find out a bit more about how to do it and to find the point of balance. <laughs> <laughs> but she even goes as far as to draw the heat of the sun down, doesn't yeah. she? To when yeah, the winter, winter sun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, she learns that actually from Granny Weatherwax. I don't know if many of the witches use it, but that's where she gets it. Oh, how lovely. I just wanted to check, Catherine, were there any other questions from the libraries? Or should we come back? Perfect, that's lovely. Hello. We're just going to bring you a microphone, if that's all right. What was your favourite book? Um, what's your favourite Discworld book? Oh, good question. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Have you just immediately oh. forgotten the name? No, of it's just an aw it's a good question and oh. an awful question. How do you pick it? Like I really love Witches Abroad. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, a, a big favourite of mine. Um, and I first read yeah. Small Gods when I was studying philosophy A level, and so I kind of I fell in love with Small Gods. And Terry signed it for me and drew a turtle in it, which is really nice. um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm not going to pick one. I, um, what small about Gods? Equal rights. And what about <laughs> of the Tiffany books? Because oh. then that narrows it down a little bit. Yes. Which yeah. is your favourite Tiffany book? Oh, even that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I haven't made it maybe, easier. Maybe, um, maybe I shall wear midnight. I was just going to say I should wear midnight, yeah. Um, because, it's a bit, because it's about the evil in people. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's more about kind of human evil rather than monstrous evil. And, it, and somehow that makes it more monstrous. Yeah. And, it, you know, it is the darkest one of it is the dark. five in some ways. Um, and, yeah, I doubt that's probably, probably my favourite, but they're, they're also wonderful. It's such a wonderful series. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it was such a kind of pleasure going back. I mean, it was, I, was, I was very familiar particularly with We Free Men, but, um, like, going back through all of them and, and kind of, like, linking them all together and, and, and stuff like that was, was amazing. Uh, but, yeah, I think that sounds like that's your favourite yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I love that. Oh, hello. Yes, Blue Dungarees. We're just going to bring you a mic. <laughs> Tiffany's broomstick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which one, ladies, was it? I was a bit nervous about this. I'm thinking people in this room are probably going to know the books so much better <laughs> than us, even after we dove into them so deeply. Who's your favourite witch? Oh! oh. oh. 
I should have left this to you guys, actually. Yeah. That's a brilliant question. <laughs> Works for me. I see. I, I'm going to have to say Nanny Og because I think like Nanny Og has a very different kind of a power. Yeah, and it's, yeah. all, it's it's sort of it's that brilliant. There's a brilliant picture in there of, of Granny um, where she's sort of uh, standing in the middle of a storm with uh, the kind of brown uh, the bramble picture, ripped yeah. um, clothes and things. But yeah, Nanny's. I think Dad just sort of said that he he believed that Nanny was actually more powerful mm. than. Granny Weatherwax, and one of her greatest powers was letting, uh, you know, Granny think that that wasn't the case. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, because she's, she's very good at the, the kind of disguise she has, the friendly affableness, and mm -hmm. being able to listen very hard, and, you know, she can get what she wants kind of much more easily, easily than, than uh, um, Granny Weatherwax. And I think, yeah, I think writing this day gave me a new appreciation for for um, Nanny Og, and I think we're, we're we're definitely both of us entering more of our, our, our Nanny Og phase of our <laughs> lives, <laughs> gradually. This is, we had some what, right yeah. Ogish comments as we were writing. Yeah. <laughs> so we really leaned into our <laughs> yeah. inner Og, didn't we? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, Tiff, uh, but, oh, there's so many, it's, they're such strong characters. Like, I think we may identify yeah. a lot with Tiff as well. Yeah. Oh, it's very really difficult. Like... I love, you know, I love Tiffy, but yeah, there's some about that Nanny Ong and Xia Xia. Mm. Yes, I'll go with Nanny Ong. I love that you also included a section on, not necessarily, on like almost part time witches, yeah. as you described mm. it, like Letitia and, and even to a sense like Magrat and that sort of mm -hmm. thing, and that not everybody had to be, you know, wearing midnight yeah. and living in a cottage of everywhere. And it was just, it's really good to sort of flag up all the different ones. And obviously, Gabrielle, you said, you said Granny. And for why, apart from obviously? Oh, yes, I mean, yeah. I, I like the fact that, you know, she is quite flawed as well with a kind of attitude and a stubbornness and everything. And yeah, I've got a lot of that stubbornness myself. And um, yeah, and it was just, I think. Equal Rights was the book where I really first fell in love with, with Discworld. As a friend had lent me, um, my friend Helen Phillips at school lent me Light Fantastic. So I read Light Fantastic and thought, some of this doesn't make sense. And then I realised it was the second, then went and read Colour of Magic, thought right now things kind of make sense. I thought, yeah, I really like the style. Um, and then I read, uh, but th yeah, then I got Equal Rights and that's just when Discworld really clicked for me, just the witches and Esk and Granny. I just absolutely fell in love with them um, and fell in love with Discworld at that moment. So I just loved the kind of strength and stubbornness, but still the bloody mindedness of, uh, of Granny. We should throw the question back and just quickly ask who your yeah. favourite is. Nanny Og. Oh. Nanny Og. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it's about Nanny. Nanny can absolutely own Granny by the way. Yeah. In the she way that could, Granny yeah. cannot own Nanny. That's brilliant. <laughs> My English gran was a, a, a real Nanny Og. <laughs> Um, we'll have these two young ladies in the second row, please. Um, excellent. Tall, blue. Blue, she stretched further. <laughs> um, uh, how did you get the ideas of making the book? Well, it was, we were looking to do something for the, the 20th anniversary of, of Tiffany. Um, and, yeah, it seemed like... A, a, thinking about all the the knowledge that tiffany had acquired from all her years being a witch we thought yeah it makes sense that she would kind of want to pass this on and she's picked up so much from you know each witch she, she's mm -hmm. trained with and actually we she trained with more witches than we first realized because yeah. we there are witches in the books that um Bold like miss Le miss level that are, are more central to the books but we actually found there's little bits where she references um training with some others just for a short periods of time yeah. old mother dismas and mistress plunder was yeah that we kind of figured she'd uh, which is with. the one with the earthworms plunder yeah yeah because yeah. yeah. <laughs> one of the earthworms gets a, a little picture in the book yeah as well. we suddenly realized um, more. It's but just... yeah we wanted to celebrate mm. tiffany and tiffany's world and her particular kind of view on witchcraft um because i think it's quite the Discworld witches are quite sort of unique. It isn't like witchcraft is depicted elsewhere. It's much more, you know, about about people, about community, um, about you know, rolling up your sleeves and doing the hard work. 
Hello. Um, I'm. I had my mum posted a Twitter um of all the Terry Pratchett books that she has, and um. I shared it. Yeah. Um, so yeah it's been lovely interacting with you on Twitter Um, and also I've got two questions so the first one (laughs) the first one is um, do you think you're going to make a movie Um, like movies of um, the Tiffany Aching books Oh, I mean, we love. It. We, there's been various things going on in the background, but it's actually finding finding the right home for it. Where, you know, uh, as um, if you if you go to to Rob's talk um, uh, n- next month, actually, I, I believe, then you'll you know one of the the most powerful things that the estate has that that, my, um, that Rob and I run is is the ability to say no to things, and like we ha- it has to be right and. Um, I, I, you know, I've been working on some Tiffany stuff of my own, and yeah, it is about finding the right home. It's, it's a bit of a difficult creative time at the moment, and we're determined that, you know, when we when we go for it, it has to be right. But you know, we'd love to. I, I work across all kinds of mediums, so I work in TV and film and comics and games. Um, so I'd love to to explore it further. But it's it's finding the right partners and the right avenues, and I can assure you that when we do it, it will be right. She's very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a professional screen actor, so it can't be too long because I'm oh. already oh, tired. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ten points for shit Hutzpah. <laughs> Shocked me so much I can't actually speak. Um, lovely. Could we have the lady in yellow? Yeah. Oh, okay. Can we um, just... Uh, okay. Hey, are you going to write another Companions and Companions book? Because I've I've got um, this one here oh. already. I I mean, yeah, we'd, yeah, we'd love to. We'd love to. That was such a lot of fun. And like, I I wrote all the poo jokes, which I'm really proud of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. And um, the lady in yellow, just in the third row. Thank you. And then we will move further back and across. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at the beginning um, how you've met. In a, working in an industry that was very sort of male dominated and certainly when I was reading Discworld in the 90s as I was growing up it wasn't that common to find books that were full of women and women working together and women working with other women um, and the Tiffany Aching books have sort of continued that um, and particularly then women learning from other women mm-hmm. and I wondered if you could sort of give us any comment on your thoughts about the importance of the witches as female characters particularly in a fantasy universe that's a really excellent question yeah i've been talking like you you (laughs) i mean yeah i think that's why we all found the the witches books just so refreshing because of you know as you say books were all just written very much of a style and very very male dominated and the female characters just there to kind of titillate really and just to have these books with such like immensely strong characters and like you say that kind of camaraderie but also the little kind of digs at each other along the way it was just they were just beautifully written and it's amazing that a kind of male fantasy author actually wrote such sort of fantastic um sort of strong female characters and this is I mean Rihanna and I um have always been so passionate about the witches books because of that and like you said we've We've worked in very all-male industries and we know how refreshing it is for women to actually see themselves represented and to see themselves represented in what's usually very male fantasy is just... I think that's why so many women are into Discworld, whereas um, other... I won't mention any of the fantasy authors by name. <laughs> um, have more of a male audience, but there's, um, there's so many women who absolutely adore the Discworld books and it's you know, absolutely, as you say. And, um, yeah, it's... It, yeah. <laughs> you also do have a brilliant section on the book um, about the cunning man and witch hunting yeah. and everything in general. And I think one of the less you know cheerful and uplifting aspects about this book is it really does bring back to the overarching history of how women mm-hmm. have been treated with suspicion, whether they're young, old, or just extant yeah. um, through the years. And that was brilliant. So, sorry, that was my comment, not a question. But I can do that, because I'm up here. Yes. <laughs> um, anybody towards the back? Anybody? Hands up. 
Oh, right, lovely chap in the back row, if that's all right. Great. Uh, hello. Having now written both independently and, and as a co-authorship, do you have a preference? Oh. oh. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I haven't... Yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoy working with Gal. I, I, I like, I would, we'd love to find more projects together. We would, yeah. It's nice, actually. I mean, it, I'm sure we both really enjoy both sort of writing and writing together. But what I, what was really great about writing together is you kind of hold each other to account a lot more, and it's really nice to have someone kind of like on you, sort of <laughs> nudging each other to actually yeah, get on with it and to kind of just have that wonderful feedback as you're writing. I mean, because we were working in live documents, so, um, I mean, we tried to leave each other alone for the first draft, but there were times we're in each other's documents and we're watching each other birthing jokes and then making <laughs> suggestions in the, the comments box at the, the side, so... Um, I mean, that, that was really great to be just getting that sort of ongoing feedback rather than writing a book entirely on your own, submitting it to the publisher yeah, I, and then kinda, the I'll kind of say this is like my favourite, like the, the one most favourite thing I've written, I think. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, oh, yeah. Nice. It was just, it was just easy, like easier, more fun than I thought it was going yeah. to be. Um, and we didn't argue at all, did we? No, I mean, we don't argue that much. We don't, really. but... You <laughs> there's, know, we... There's, there's some gentle bickering sometimes. Yeah. About um, the number of mentions of nice cups of tea. Yes, and, and how, how correcting the <laughs> end of the start of the sentence. And yeah. yeah, like, it, yeah, it's, gen, it's, it's gentle bickering. But it, it just, I think how our, our kind of, we sort of merge our styles. And, like, mm. there is, uh, you, you know, as, as you, you were saying earlier, sometimes we didn't know, like, it, it, whether who had written what line. Yeah. So they just kind of, like, merge together mm. really nicely. I mean, you talk about merging styles, but also, obviously, you're using characters that your dad wrote for years. How did you manage to avoid trying to ape what he might have said or written or, and just to make it sound realistic to the characters, mm. but without, you know, trying to imitate? There's a shape. Mm. There's a shape to it. Like, it's... Because I've done a, a fair bit of adaptation from book to screen, and, and the, the thing about adaptation is it's kind of what you what you cut out, what you leave in, and how you sew it together. And, and the, the sewing together is, is about how you keep things in the shape of the work. And so it's finding the, the right type of thread to, to, to just sew everything together again after you cut bits out. And certainly when I've uh, worked on adapting Dad's work as well, I could, I could get the thread easier. Like there was something in the blood that helped me go, oh, okay, that's the right thread to sew it together. And because I've sort of drunk from the same, no a lot of the same knowledge wellspring as Dan, and I, like, I grew up with him and he taught me not how to be a writer, but how to be a human being. Mm. And that's by, but sort of writer by stealth, really. Um, and that, that's definitely helped me a lot. So we wanted, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that the characters felt like the characters, mm -hmm. but we wanted to sort of bring in little new insights and sort of weave things together and keep it in the shape of Discworld. I think as well, because we were writing through the voice of Tiffany Aching, we were kind of writing as Tiffany. We weren't trying to write as Terry Pratchett. Yeah. We were writing yeah, in Tiffany's voice, which probably made it a lot easier for us not to try and not to try and be Terry Pratchett. And, and trying to capture Tiffany's sort of journal voice yeah. as well was, I think that was a little bit of a challenge because often a lot of the humour comes around observation, you know, observations in Tiffany's head and from characters around Tiffany. So it was to make her voice kind of entertaining as well. Um, as well, you know, as well as all the characters kind of around her. And I think, yeah, we struck a good balance. Yeah. That, I think. And we're going live to libraries. <laughs> um, we, I've got a question from Andy. Um, do you feel there's something sad about the way Tiffany's fellow villagers never quite know how to deal with her being a witch? And in some cases are, are quite frightened of her. And, and what does that say about her as a, a character? I think the, maybe the fear is a little bit important. I think that's mm, what Granny Mather actually say. Fun. Like ha having people being a little bit afraid of you can be useful. Um, but then so can, how, like, you know, I think Nanny Og would sort of suggest that, that that's the Nanny Og, Granny Wagglewax thing. So I think Nanny, Nanny wouldn't necessarily want the fear because she can get in a, in a different route yeah. by being friendly and affable, whereas Granny Wagglewax could get in via fear. Mm -hmm. So it is, yeah, I think it would depend on which, which witch you talk to about. 
I think she um, is more except on the chalk like, towards the end. Um, I think she, yeah, is more. I think her people just people of the chalk were just not quite sure how to deal with sort of the, this was little Tiff who went yeah, away and is yeah. now back and a witch. So I think it took them a while to come around to it. But I, I feel they did more towards the end of the series. So, yeah. Yeah, it's the respect. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we we wrote we write about respect a lot in yeah. books, and that's such a key to um, to being a witch. And that uh, you know, Nanny Og and, and Granny Wild Directs kind of argue a little bit about how to get respect and what respect. It's all means. about respect and bees yeah, that's where we found we got and cups it's of tea. It's all about respect and bees. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's about bees and <laughs> all like that. Hello, uh, teal shirt in the middle. Just going to pass you a microphone. Um, okay. Um, this is kind of, I think, building on some of the other questions, but having written so much about the lives of witches and the experiences, um, would you yourselves, if you were in Discworld, wish to be witches, and if so, what type? Or would you prefer a different role and to explore kind of the op other opportunities that the world offers? Ooh. So I didn't catch just the last bit. Do, would, do we, would we like to be Discworld witches, basically, would we like or, or like any other roles within Discworld? Oh, um, I'm just thinking if I was, like, what, what kind of witch? I'd, I'd probably like to be kind of a nanny og kind of witch at the centre of the... Community. Although, do you know, I've kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit more standoffish. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you're, you're a mom. I'm not only a mom of cats. So. Yeah. Um, I know. I mean, I do like the little, the, you know, the little cottage with the with the kind of goats and the chickens. Mm. And that's really how I yeah. grew up, actually. I did grow up in the cottage with goats and chickens. Um, I think, you know, I'd like to, I, I'd probably like to... If, if unseen university relax their policies on, um, on oh, yeah. women, then you know going going retiring there, getting a nice little a, a, you know a nice set of rooms and your your meals made. Yeah. <laughs> that's, quite, that's, that's quite a good retirement. Thing. I think that's you know that that would have dad's kind of retirement plan would be to do that at Trinity College mm. in Dublin. It was just like yeah, get we do a kind of die of a porterhouse blue kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I've been an academic. It's not as nice as this. <laughs> so yeah, I kind of yeah, more of a Tom Sharp view on that. Um, but yeah, like I, I think I feel we're both quite witchy anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah we're halfway there already. <laughs> yeah. Oh, lovely. Um, chap with the beard and the grey jumper just up at the back. Oh, it's Hi. Liam. I know. <laughs> Hello. Um, any thoughts about doing any more similar books to this? It feels like the format would work really well with like the City Watch. I mean, we, we've we've put some ideas to to <laughs> Robert Smith <laughs> Wilkins and who yeah. have you been speaking to? <laughs> We do, we, we do actually think that Horace the Cheese and the Magic Sausage should be like a new children's book. Um, <laughs> sorry to just point your boots. Oh, it's my cat. Um, Model. <laughs> but uh, yes, there yeah. are certainly kind of we've, yeah, we've um, books that lend themselves. We'll, we'll kind of see how this one does and see this what This is very non-committal, so it sounds yeah. quite... <laughs> yes. Cough, cough, Penguin Random House. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Wilkins, second row, staring at his feet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Lovely. Uh, just this chap just here with the glasses. Yeah, one minute. Hello. Um, there's this big resurgence uh, now in the in the culture of witchcraft, and um, I was wondering what role you might think that is playing uh, for people. Why so many people are interested in witchcraft and being witches, uh, not just in a fantasy context, but but in a in a quote, real world, unquote, context. I know we were, we were talking about the, um, was it the MA in witchcraft? I think it might be Exeter University. Because yeah. we feel like we've probably already written the dissertation uh, yeah. there. <laughs> um, but actually, I think it's a very, it's, there, I mean, there's obviously different types of witchcraft depicted in, in literature, but I think what is particularly um, pertinent about Discworld, which is, is, is the 
the being there for people, the help, the community, the helping people with skin, doing the hard work. Um, un understand that it might not be your fault, but it's your responsibility. Like looking after people, I think that's in the, in this kind of day and age is is r more important than ever. Um, you know, sp speaking up for them that has no voices. Um, it's become it's become even more important. So I think particularly that's it makes the disc world which is resonate in a way that I don't think they, they ever have as much before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> On which succinct note, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this afternoon, but just a huge thank you to Rihanna Pratchett and Gabrielle Kent. <laughs>Yeah, absolutely. Um, they'll be signing outside in just a couple of minutes. I should just say, if anybody is interested in real life witches, as well as witches in fiction, we've got a fantastic down the 4th of November called A Festival of the Accused, which uh, is some history, some fiction, some witchcraft. So please uh, check that out. Thanks again. Mm.